So um, this is really why I'm here. So the, the problem we've been facing in our industry or our profession or our science or whatever you want to call it or think about it as is that um, we've been trying to solve these problems for a long time, um, but we don't always understand them very well. And that's kind of what Ryan was talking about with the, the conceptual site model um, and various ways of, of gathering data and looking at data and thinking about the problems. Um, but early on, one of the biggest problems was we just didn't have enough data or the right kind of data uh, to understand these problems. Uh, and, and that leads to having a lot of remedy failures or, or remedies that don't perform up to expectation, maybe. Um, and that can be a very expensive undertaking when you've got a whole remedy in place and you realize it's not working and you, you kind of have to go back to the drawing board. Um, and in addition to that, I'm going to go on a bit of a tirade in a minute here about using monitoring wells to characterize sites. Um, and one of the things that leads to is having, um, you know, lots and lots of monitoring wells at a site, many of which aren't in the right place. Um, and were put in for purposes other than long-term monitoring. Um, and, and then you're sort of stuck with those wells in a lot of cases, and you're gonna do quarterly monitoring or semi-annual or annual monitoring with them, and the cost of that can be enormous. Um, and so those two things together drive uh, really expensive remediation projects. Um, now, high-resolution sub-characterization, which is an answer to, to the lack of understanding, um, basically, you know, it, it has somewhat higher costs initially, you know, compared to installing three monitoring wells, for example, doing a, a comprehensive high resolution site characterization is more expensive. But if you look at it in terms of a life cycle, um, you more than make up for that expenditure as you move through the process um, and hopefully avoid these long term monitoring expenses and the failed remedies. Uh, I think there's a bunch of EPA folks here today. Maybe they'll they'll recognize this. This is a, the Superfund Optimization Program, which I've been working on a little bit uh, in in recent years. Um, and the idea is basically you you get invited in to look at some of these sites um, that maybe aren't performing the way that that people thought they would, and you just sort of go over all the information that's available um, and and come up with some ideas about. Uh, how you can improve the situation and move the site towards closure uh, a little more readily. And these are the uh, recommended um, portions or, or outcomes, sorry, of, um, of a care of the um, optimization. Um, and we'll look at some of the outcomes specifically here. So the first one on the left, is CSM improvements and, and almost 70% of the sites that have been looked at, at least to this point, I think this was as of 2015, almost 70% of them needed CSM improvements. And actually, you know, quite honestly, a lot of the, the sites actually didn't have a CSM that was stated explicitly. And that turns out to be a, a pretty major problem. Um, and 36% needed a different remedy. And that actually turns out to be an even bigger problem, but it's tied to the first problem. So if your CSM is incorrect or incomplete, the likelihood that you're gonna pick the right remedy and design it correctly is, mm -hmm. is pretty low, really. Um, so that's really what we're about, is, is trying to get it right uh, the first time, or maybe the second time, but not the fourth or fifth time, you know, that we wanna, we wanna speed this process up and make it more efficient. And one of the things that's been happening over the years since the beginning of, of CERCLA, and this data set goes back to the, to the first remedies, um, this is in situ remedies. And that's, uh, you know, you can see that there's been a steady increase in in situ remedies. And that's driven the need for a lot more high resolution characterization. Um, in the early days, everything was pump and treat. We had one answer for everything. Um, and that's where DNAPL started to become important because we used to think that, you know, you could go out there and, and characterize the zone of contamination and then you just needed to pump you know, X number of aquifer volumes out of it and you would flush this contamination out and then you could shut it down and you'd be done. Um, but that didn't take into account the fact that you have potentially DNAPL present or that you have a lot of mass sorbed to organic matter in the aquifer or more recently that you have a lot of mass tied up in low K zones in the pore water and silts and clays or rock matrices as the case may be. Um, 
that's going to come out very, very slowly. It's diffusion rate limited. Um, so, you know, you can kind of see from this diagram here that, that about 1991, um, when all of this began to be better understood, the number of pump and treat remedies crashed. Um, and it continues to go down. It's basically used today mostly for containment. There are a few pump and treat remedies that are actually cleaning up sites, but for the most part, uh, it's given way to um, in situ remedies. And then there's a lot of other, uh, you know, institutional controls has become incredibly important since we've realized we, we don't have the ability to completely clean up sites in short periods of time. And some other things that I won't get into here. So, uh, Ryan mentioned this, and this is this is to me at least really important, and I don't think it can be emphasized enough. Um, groundwater monitoring and characterization are two different things. Um, they have different objectives. Characterization is intended to understand the problem, um, and and it's a lot more than understanding sort of the spatial dimensions of the problem. It's understanding. Uh, all the different processes that go on, you know, what is the source? Is it an apple? Is, you know, all the things I just described, is it back diffusion? Um, you know, what are the, what are the fate mechanisms? All those things need to be understood. Monitoring, on the other hand, is designed to, to tell you if you're having the desired effect or not. It's to see what kind of changes happen over time. And those two objectives require that you have basically a whole different set of tools, uh, and a whole different set of approaches. Um, and, you know, historically, and still today, we, we tend to characterize with monitoring wells um, to our detriment, I think. And the reason um, why you need different tools is that the, the technologies that you use really affect your understanding of the data that you're getting out of those technologies. Um, and there's endless examples, but you know, one that, that just popped in my head yesterday when we had this this meeting was, uh, um, you know, if you're sitting in the dark and you're looking out into the woods, you have one image of what the woods looks looks like. But if you use uh, you know night vision goggles or infrared, then you have a whole different view of what's going on in the woods. And it's it's like that with environmental technologies. Geophysics is a is a good example as well. You know, each geophysical tool gives you an image of the site, um, none of which is, is, a, is a diagram of the type that we like to turn things into, but they're all different ways of looking at things that you can, you can exploit to gain a better understanding. Now, monitoring wells have been our, our favorite, um, but one of the issues with, with any measuring tool is the scale of measurement, the scale at which you make the measurement. It needs to be uh, appropriate to the scale of the variability of the thing that you're looking at, um, whether that's hydraulic conductivity or concentration or whatever. Um, and conventional monitoring wells have a couple of problems. One, we typically put in fairly long screens with them. Um, you know, back in the old days, they used to be, you know, 50 foot, you know, 60 foot, maybe even 100 long open boreholes. Um, then they became, you know, the standard became 10 feet. Now a short screen is about five feet. But I'm going to show you a bunch of information that that indicates that um, well, it doesn't indicate it. it. It just shows you that that you know even those lengths are much too long. Uh, and in addition to the length being too long, to the scale being wrong, the issue is that you get depth integrated flow weighted average measurements out of wells across the screened interval. Um, and you know for some purposes, averages are good. Like you know if you're doing uh, soil sampling, you do want to average. You want to know what the what the exposure is going to be to somebody on the surface of that site. But with subsurface characterization and groundwater in particular, you need to understand the processes and the scale at which they're operating in order to be able to solve the problem because you don't have access to the subsurface the same way you do to the surface. And lastly, uh, monitoring wells have pretty high life cycle costs. So, uh, you know, you install the well, you develop it, you sample it, and then you're probably going to have to keep sampling it for some period of time. Long-term monitoring programs um, can be really expensive. We had a, a situation where, um, you know, there was a site where they were spending, I think, about 80000 a year on long-term monitoring. This site was, you know, probably 20 years old. Um, and what they were learning was that monitored natural attenuation wasn't really getting it done. So they decided to take one year's worth of monitoring money, $80,000, 
and do a bunch of high resolution site characterization and found out that their understanding of the plume was completely inaccurate. Um, so those high life cycle costs in some cases aren't even really helping you out that much, except you know, in this case, they, they pointed out that uh, MNA wasn't working. Oops, sorry about that, going backwards. So this is a, a profile of tetrachloroethene uh, in a sandy aquifer. Each red dot is a sample. The samples are separated by uh, 20 centimeters vertically. So this is one of those cases of a, a scientific madman run amok, basically, that, you know, we're getting, getting data on, an, on a ridiculous scale. Um, although the guy that came along after me started collecting the data on 15 centimeter spacings, just to, to go a little more amok. But anyway, what you can see here is, so between these two uh, vertical samples spaced 20 centimeters apart, we have an order of magnitude concentration increase. Um, and Ryan was talking about collecting soil samples on a five foot spacing. So, you know, this entire plume uh, occurs in about a, uh, you know, six to seven foot thick zone. So you could almost miss the whole plume if you're working on that kind of spacing. Also, the concentration goes from non-detect up to about 43,000 parts per billion uh, over about a meter and a half, which is about five feet. So very steep concentration gradients, very little vertical dispersion going on, not much mixing. Um, and the reason that that happens, well, we'll get to that in a second. So, so having seen that distribution, I then installed a five foot long monitoring well screen right through the core of that plume, developed it, sampled it, all that. Uh, and the concentration I got is shown on the graph. It's about 1100 uh, micrograms per liter, which is a fine number. Um, but the, the peak concentration outside the well that the well's installed through is 43,000 parts per billion. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there. And the reason for that discrepancy is what I was talking about earlier, this depth integrated flow weighted averaging problem. So this is the hydraulic conductivity distribution along uh, the zone in which the monitoring well was screened. And it goes from 10 to the minus three centimeters per second up to 10 to the minus one centimeters per second. The lowest hydraulic conductivity is this one right here, which happens to be in the center of the screen where the highest concentrations are. So when you uh, stress this well, or even when you don't stress it much, even if it was just flowing through, um, and typically monitoring wells don't, by the way, because the sand packs are, are a different hydraulic conductivity than the formation is. So you tend to get mixing uh, in monitoring wells and flow up and down the sand pack in the well screen, um, unless there's absolutely no vertical component. But in any case, so, so most of the water we're getting into this well is coming from the top and the bottom where these concentrations are relatively low. Still in the hundreds, maybe even a thousand, but not in the tens of thousands like they are in the middle of the screen. And this is what monitoring wells do. This is, this is how they function. Um, so in some ways they're actually just hiding information from you. And, and you know, in terms of long-term monitoring, that's probably not a problem. But in terms of building a CSM and trying to understand a site to the point that you can select and design a remedy, I would argue that it is a problem. Um, you know, if you knew that you had 43,000 versus 1,000, would that make a difference in your thinking about the site? I'm actually asking that question. <laughs> would, would it make a difference? Yes. Yeah. So it's important to know that. Um, there's a lot better ways to do that now. Um, you know, back when, when I was in grad school, you know, we had to collect all those samples. Now you can go out and screen it with a MIP or something like that, and then you can focus on those peaks and the areas in between the peaks much more efficiently and still get the kind of information that you need. So this is a cartoon that, that um, my, my mentor, John Cherry, put together. Um, he's put about 10,000 of these together <laughs> over the years. But you know, the, the idea is that you have this true distribution of contamination in the, in the aquifer. Um, and if you use point sampling, but you collect samples fairly sparsely, you're going to get a, a different curve that, that maybe displays some of the characteristics of the real curve, but not all of them. And note that these are point samples. In this example, the high resolution multi-level system example, you have a, a sort of short screen and, and many samples that you're collecting and you get kind of a better distribution that represents better what this uh, real distribution is. 
And then if you use long screens, and relatively few of them, you get another, yet another curve that it doesn't really represent the actual curve. So that's, that's the interplay between interval, which is the open area, the sampled interval, and the spacing between those samples. So you have to find that right balance. And again, you know, continuous uh, sampling devices like MIP um, sort of take care of that for you because they just sample every five one hundredths of a foot regardless and give you everything and then you can figure out uh, where to go from there. And then this issue of how much is enough. Um, I, I usually show a slide of William Blake saying that, you know, you can never know how much is enough until you know how much is too much. And I don't know how many of you know much about William Blake, but the, there's a good chance he was talking about drinking rather than um, hydrogeology. But, but the, you know, the idea holds is that, you know, you, you do what I did with the 20 centimeter thing, and then you, you go back and say, wow, I didn't really need to do that. Um, and again, with screening tools, you know, we can do that without a lot of pain, financial pain, time, and all that, um, and then focus on the areas that we need to focus on. So here's a, here's a little um, sort of experiment with some real data from a real site. This is, again, uh, tetrachloroethene in a sandy aquifer. Um, and, you know, somehow all of us get indoctrinated early on in our careers. I don't know where it happens or when, but, um, you know, we, we learn that if it's a DNAPL problem, we need to look vertically. And looking vertically means you have a shallow sample, a medium sample or intermediate sample, and a deep sample. Everybody in this room has probably done this, right? Um, and that's fine, except that, you know, DNAPL and concentrations don't organize themselves that way. So in this case, we've got a, a peak concentration down here about 11 meters below ground surface. Um, that is uh, 180 ppb, maybe something like that. Um, but if we had decided instead to just sample on a 10 foot spacing, and these are point samples again, so the, the, uh, the interval is very small. Now, all of a sudden, we see a, a 10,000 ppb result. So again, a big, a big difference. And then if we sample at five feet, we get a little better definition. And now we know that this plume core is a little bit thicker than when we sampled at 10 feet, and therefore, the mass flux is probably going to be greater. Um, but the peak concentration didn't change much, and its position didn't change a whole lot. And then if you go the, you know, the full uh, crazy scientist approach, you get that sort of curve right there, which is actually the same curve we looked at uh, in a couple of slides earlier. Um, so, oops. so there is a, there's a, enough is enough somewhere in here. And it's, in this case, it's probably around five feet. Um, there's one thing, well, I'll, I'll, I'll show you this next batch of slides first and then cover that. So, so here we are again in a, in a cross-sectional view. So we've got our distance horizontally down here and we've got our elevation vertically here. And we're doing the shallow, medium, and deep thing again. And this is the plume we, we uh, interpolate from these data. So we've got a lot of 100 ppb area. Um, we have some lower concentrations, but we don't have much clean groundwater there or non-detect groundwater. But if we sample on our 10-foot vertical spacing, we get quite a different picture. We get much smaller 100 ppb zones, and we get more non-detect areas, interestingly enough. And then if we sample intensively or in a high-resolution way, uh, this, this happens. And this is kind of interesting. So we have this really high concentration bullseye here. Um, and there's a, a study or a paper by a guy named Martin Gilbo. Uh, from years ago that found that you get about 75% or more of your mass discharge through about 5 to 10% of the cross-sectional area of the plume. So think of that for a minute. So, so you've got this cross-section and, you know, three quarters or more, we found up to 80 to 90% uh, is discharging through 5 to 10% of the cross-sectional area of the plume. So the first issue is you know, well, how do you even find that? You know, if you're if you're doing monitoring well investigation, how would you find those spots? And the answer is you probably wouldn't um, unless you got incredibly lucky. But the the value of finding them is that then you can do a much more surgical kind of remedy. You can really focus on those zones and knock down the mass flux by 80 or 90 percent uh, with relatively 
little expenditure compared to trying to treat the whole cross-sectional area. So where we are right now in, in terms of development of, of uh, how we approach these problems is that you know high resolution has gained a lot of traction over the last 20 years. Uh, and a lot of that has been helped by, by high resolution tools that, that people like Randy St. Germain have created at Dakota Technologies. Uh, Geoprobe has had a big hand in it with um, uh, the MIP and some other tools. Um, and just people banging away on the drum. So, so we're finally getting some, some high resolution um, involved in projects. It's still, I think, in a stage where people who are working on um, you know, smaller projects tend to think, well, this isn't really for small projects. This is just for great big, huge sites. And I would encourage you to, to rethink that, that, that if you start out, even if you think it's a small problem, if you get your understanding of it right early on, the whole process is going to go a lot better. Um, you know, I've worked on a lot of little gasoline sites over the years, and, and you know, some of them can linger for really long periods of time and end up costing a lot of money. Um, when if they'd just been understood a little better, you know, just like people, you understand them better, then they're going to function better. Um, so, you know, a lot of this involves, uh, you know, better understanding of the processes going on underground, like diffusion and back diffusion, which are sustaining a lot of the plumes. And a lot of the plumes we work on. Uh, were kind of created in the, you know, prior to the 80s, for the most part, a lot of post-World War II up to the 80s kind of releases. And in a lot of those situations, the Dean Apple may already be gone. It may have all dissolved, but most of that mass might be nearby in the low permeability zones. So it's locked up in the poor water in those low K zones. So you have to have a way to figure that out. You know, is that where the mass is? Is that what the source is now? You know, the source originally was Dean Apple, but maybe now it's not. Um, and as I already mentioned, we have a, a number of newish tools. Um, people are starting to use a lot of non-permanent groundwater sampling tools, that is not monitoring wells, but you know, direct push or other types of, of groundwater sampling. Um, and I think one thing that's still underutilized is coring below the water table and getting good soil samples from the low permeability zones so that you know what the, the role of matrix diffusion and back diffusion actually is um, because if you if you don't and again so with injection remedies you're gonna you're gonna go around and inject you know on a grid or however you're gonna do it um, but most of the stuff that you inject ends up going out the high permeability pathways and doesn't go very far in the low permeability pathways so it's it's more than just understanding the boundaries of the problem it's understanding the distribution of hydraulic conductivity relative to the distribution of concentration and so if, if all of your mass is in the low K zones and all of your reagent is in the high K zones, um, you know, that's a bit of a puzzle that you need to spend some time thinking about. Uh, and then lastly, what I would say is that, you know, once you understand the problem, then you can go in and put in your, your monitoring network. That, that's when it's time to drill monitoring wells. And ideally for a lot of sites that would include multi-level systems rather than just uh, you know, single screen monitoring wells. Oops, I want to skip over that. So there's a, a lot of different sort of platforms that can get you underground. Um, and my guess is that the most commonly used ones are probably hollow stem auger still. And, and for uh, you know much of the 80s and 90s, that was sort of the go-to technology. Um, and direct push is also pretty big these days if you're working in unconsolidated deposits that aren't till. Uh, or, or boulder fields and dense gravels and that kind of thing. Um, and I think, um, you know, those, augering still has a, a big role to play. There's, and, and part of that role is, be, is to use it in conjunction with other techniques like direct push. So one of the things we've been doing over the years is, is uh, you know, doing a direct push kind of sampling program, whether it's groundwater or soil or hydraulic conductivity or whatever. But eventually you get refused, right? Especially in New England, um, you're gonna get refused sooner or later, or, or your tool is. And, and so what happens then is a lot of people just say, okay, well, you know, that's it for direct push. But often what you can do is you can, even with the same rig, you can auger through whatever that obstruction was, and then go back down inside the hollow stem auger with your direct push tool and keep going. So you can get more data from deeper 
um, by combining these technologies. And we sort of refer to that as hybrid drilling platforms. Um, we've done the same kinds of things with, with rotary techniques, uh, mostly mud rotary and often with casing advanced systems. So mud rotary by itself, you don't case the hole. You just, you just use the mud to keep the hole open and you have this bit that goes down and pumps the mud up and it puts a cake, mud cake on the wall. And a lot of people don't like that um, if they're going to install monitoring wells because then you have to clean all that mud off during the development process. Um, you know, before your well will really function very well. And that's a, that's a valid argument if you're putting in a monitoring well. Um, but you can use it to get to, to depths that you couldn't otherwise get to. And we've done direct push investigations, believe it or not, on Long Island to depths of about 600 feet by combining mud rotary and direct push together. Um, and, you know, we're able to, to really sort of understand how all these different plumes were coalescing and, and uh, you know, impinging on water supply wells. Um, so air rotary is another really fast technique and, and it, it is a great technique to use if you need to get a hole in the ground to put to install something, uh, a monitoring well, an MLS, whatever it might be. Uh, it's great in, in fractured rock. Um, it does tend to, you, you use a lot of high pressure air and that tends to blow out into the fractures and push the water out into the fractures. So there's a period of time after you drill um, where your, your whole system is kind of disturbed and you need to wait a while uh, before you can really sample in there. Um, I've got cable tool rigs on here. Let me just take a quick poll. How many people here have drilled with a cable tool rig? Three, wow, I'm shocked. What? Seen. You've seen one, yeah. I've seen pictures. I've actually seen them work as well, um, but they're not real big in, in New England or anywhere in the East, really. They're they're kind of a Midwest phenomenon, and they're they're even uh, petering out out there. But they're they're good in the sense that um, they don't really disrupt the hole very much. They don't disrupt conditions, but they are kind of slow, um, and you just can't find one around here. So the opposite of of slow and not disruptive is sonic. Um, and I worked for, for uh, Cascade Drilling the last couple of years, um, and they're a big sonic outfit. But um, sonic has its, its really good sides and some not so good sides. And the really good side is that it can drill through just about anything, uh, and it can do it pretty quickly. You also, you know, its default drilling method is coring. So you're going to get a continuous core of whatever it is you're drilling through, unlike with air rotary or mud rotary or one of those techniques, or even augering for that matter. Um, so you'll get these continuous cores, sometimes in 20 foot long runs. Uh, and you can lay them out and look at them. Um, and then you can install wells and, and whatever. Um, but there are some, some drawbacks in terms of chemical sampling in those holes, and I'll, I'll spend a bit of time on that later. Um, so another quick poll, when you're, when you're drilling, how many people drill primarily with hollow stem auger? How many people don't drill at all? <laughs> okay, how about direct push? Okay, a lot of people. Sonic, a few, it's kind of expensive. Um, how about other rotary, mud or air? A couple. So it's really direct push and a little bit of augering, um, which isn't surprising. And, and those are, are great techniques to use. So the way Sonic works um, is you've got these two, uh, these two revolving kind of weights that, that spin around in this housing and they you can adjust the speed at which they spin and you can sort of adjust the eccentricity so that it's it's vibrating at you know different harmonics and the idea is to get a harmonic set up and that's what these little squiggles represent and it gets transmitted from this drive head down the down the casing and, and what's happening essentially is that the steel casing is is really doing this on a microscopic level and, and what happens is that gets transmitted to the formation uh, and the formation becomes liquefied, essentially. So you actually get the sediment or the soils to flow. And in this case, so you're driving your core barrel down in with, with sonic vibration. 
and you're you've got liquefaction happening so that so the materials flow up into the whoa, flow up into the uh, core barrel fairly readily and that's great that helps with with recovery um, but it isn't great if you want to look at the detailed structure of the of the aquifer materials which is often pretty important so that's a trade-off but anyway once you've got your core barrel advanced then you you advance an override casing or you basically over drill that core barrel uh, and then you pull the core barrel up inside the override casing leaving that casing in place so that keeps your hole open and then you can go back down inside that but one of the things that happens once you get significantly below the water table is anytime you leave a casing uh, open at the bottom in the formation you tend to get uh, heave you get material blowing up into the bottom of that casing uh, due to the hydrostatic pressure of the groundwater. Um, and so the way around that, unfortunately, for, for most drilling techniques is to use a lot of water to, to balance that hydrostatic pressure. And that can be an issue uh, when, you're, when you're trying to do chemical sampling in the borehole. So I'm going to talk a little bit about characterization approaches now, and then a little bit later we'll talk about uh, monitoring approaches, again, trying to Keep in your mind that those are different things. Um, and so these are uh, high resolution site characterization tools, although you could use them in a low, a low resolution manner, I suppose. So in the Vado zone, you've got soil gas sampling. Um, and, and as Ryan mentioned, you know, this is a big deal now, not just for trying to figure out, you know, where the plumes are and aren't, where the sources are and aren't, but um, actually, is, it, is this a pathway? You know, is there risk presented? Um, through vapor intrusion of, of uh, buildings. And there's a bunch of ways you can do this sampling. You can use passive samplers, you can use active samplers, you can profile you know, down to the water table, uh, you can do time series sampling and all those things. Um, and there, there are roles for all of those, uh, depending on what it is you're trying to show. Soil gas uh, concentrations are, are, are pretty, um, I'm gonna say volatile, but what I mean is they change a lot over time. Uh, they respond fairly quickly to changes in, in pressure gradients and things like that. So doing some temporal sampling is not a bad idea. Also in the Vado zone, you can use screening tools like the membrane interface probe or MIHPT, uh, and you can do soil coring and, and profile sampling of the soil cores. And in the saturated zone, uh, there's direct sensing tools like MIP, and then the, the, the NAPL tools that are basically the laser uh, induced fluorescence tools. And often now those are coupled with electrical conductivity uh, and or injection logging. So you're actually injecting water into the formation and monitoring the flow and the pressure and getting an idea of the, the uh, hydraulic conductivity distributions. So you're getting a lot of information regarding how the site functions in, certain, in terms of transport, storage, and that sort of thing in a single push, um, which is a really valuable thing. Uh, and then there's groundwater sample profiling of the permeable zones, the higher K zones, uh, and soil coring and sampling of the lower K zones. And again, this is all about uh, matrix diffusion um, and back diffusion. How many folks have used the MIP? Maybe a third. Um, so the MIP is a, you know, it's been around for a long time and how it works basically is you drive this probe into the ground and on the probe, there's a, there's a heater block, it's a plate, uh, and there's 120 volt current running down there, and, and, and that heats up the plate to about 120 degrees C. And then if you start driving it, the temperature drops a little bit. The idea is to keep it above 100 degrees C, not drive it so fast that you drop below 100. So you're essentially boiling off the water in contact with the, with the heater plate. Um, and at the same time, boiling off all the volatile organics that are, that are in the water. Uh, and then the pressure gradient created from the um, from the, the the heating and the creation of steam pushes this stuff across a, a permeable membrane. Basically, it's a Teflon membrane, PTFE, uh, and it gets picked up by a, a carrier gas, uh, usually nitrogen, and, and carried to the surface, and then dumped into a series of detectors that are housed in a gas chromatograph box. But there is no chromatography step, so the so the gas is just dumped into the detectors with no separation of molecules. Uh, so you can't identify anything. 
Um, and the detector just reacts to the bulk load of contaminant that comes in. And it, it would react differently to different mixes of contamination. So you can see there's some variability involved. But the gist of it is that you get a nice complete log and you can see where the peaks are and where there are no peaks and, and those types of things. Um, and you can you know, understand very quickly the spatial distribution of things. Now you don't necessarily know what the concentrations are, but you know where the concentrations are likely to be quite high versus where they're likely to be quite low. And also it's pretty productive, you know, 150 to 250 linear feet per day of exploration with a MIP um, is, is pretty good. I mean, you compare that to doing soil sampling and that sort of thing, it's, it's uh, very productive. You can use it in both the saturated and unsaturated zones and you can use them uh, you use the data immediately, um, which allows you to use these dynamic work strategies and be more efficient in the field. But so here's the concentration piece. So so this uh, these numbers across the top are whole numbers on three different transects located quite closely together on a site up in southern New Hampshire. Um, so we had a total of 25 holes in a fairly small area on three transects. This visual correlation line basically uh, quantifies from one to three, with one being good. Um, you know, how, how well did the position of the peak in the MIP data reflect the position of a peak in a soil and or groundwater profile? In other words, is, did we find the contamination? Did we find the right place with the MIP? And you can see most of these are ones. There's the occasional bad one, but most of them are ones. And that's what MIP does well. So it, it, it gives you this complete data record and says, you know, at, at between 20 and 22 and a half feet, you have elevated detector responses, which indicate that elevated concentrations. So now what you can do is you can go in and find out what the concentrations are in those zones, maybe a few samples in the less, less uh, elevated zones and, and get an understanding of that without doing the, the 20 centimeter sampling thing. Um, and that's pretty valuable. But then, um, you know, if we look at the ECD R squared, and that's these numbers down here, you can see, you know, an R squared of, of 0.32. Even a geologist wouldn't say 0.32 is a good R squared for correlation between two measurement tools. I'm a geologist, by the way. Um, and here's one that's 0.07. So these are poor. These are very poor correlations, maybe to the point of not being correlations even. Um, the average for this transect is 0.37. So, you know, again, you wouldn't want to try to create a, a numerical correlation between the two and convert your, your uh, detector responses into parts per billion of PCE, for example, because you'd be way wrong most of the time. Same thing on this other transect, although the average of this transect is, is 0.72, which, you know, is getting up into geology respectable range. Chemists still would, would run screaming from the room at a 0.72. Um, and in this one, you know, we've still got some, some very low ones like 0 0.01, that's uncorrelated, uh, but as high as 0.92. So occasionally you find situations where they correlate well, but overall on that transect, it's 0.37. And for all 25 of them, it's 0.49. Uh, and, and a lot of other people have done this kind of work and published it. And, um, you know, so that information is out there. So I would encourage you, you know, not to try to do those sorts of correlations, but use the MIP the way it was intended to be, which is as a spatial identification tool. Where's the problem? Then you can go in and define that problem better. So it's the idea of a screening tool versus a definitive tool. Now, one of the really cool things about MIP is that they, they introduced injection logging with a MIP a bunch of years ago so that you're, you're not only getting electrical conductivity logging, so here's a dipole down here that does that for you, um, but you're getting injection logging data. And, and I've done this kind of stuff all over the country for quite a while. And what I found is that electrical conductivity works really well for stratigraphic interpretation in some parts of the country. Works really well in the Midwest in general. Um, doesn't work that well in New England, uh, and there are other places as well. And the reason for that is that there are other things that affect uh, electrical conductivity besides just um, particle size, and that's what what this relies on. So the the injection port thing, however, lets you inject water, measure the flow rate and the pressure, on a continuous basis, uh, and that's almost always good reliable data in terms of you know what are the the hydraulic conductivity distributions looking like vertically. 
Then the laser induced fluorescence tools. Um, with one exception here, these are, I believe, now uh, limited to Dakota technology. So Randy St. Germain, um, you know, got the license for these, for, you know, for the first tool, um, which turned into UVOST, which is the ultraviolet optical screening tool, uh, which works for, you know, fuels gasoline, things like that. Um, aromatics that don't have a lot of rings. So you get into the bigger PAHs, UVOST isn't going to see that, but it'll see the, the benzene, toluene, and all that, even naphthalene. Um, and then he came up with Targos, because there's another set of NAPL sites out there that, that are aromatic based. Um, and those are coal tar sites and creosote sites, wood treating sites, for example. Um, so Targos stands for green optical screening tool. So this is a laser that pulses green wavelength light as opposed to ultraviolet that the UVOS does. Um, and then just a few years ago, so one of the problems that, so I've mentioned aromatics, right, for the, for the laser induced fluorescence. Um, aliphatics like chlorinated solvents don't fluoresce under laser light. You can't get them to fluoresce. So uh, Randy decided what he would do. And at the same time, you've probably seen all these studies where, where people are using uh, you know, hydrophobic dyes to, to react with the napples to turn it red, for example. And the University of Waterloo used to do that with all their napple releases so they could find it after they released it and figure out what happened to it. Um, but there's a hydrophobic dye that Randy injects uh, down the hole and it, it dissolves into a napple, a chlorinated solvent napple, if it's there, and it will fluoresce if it's dissolved in the napple, but not if it's in the water. So now we have a way to, to do laser induced fluorescence profiling for chlorinated solvent de napples, which is huge because it's pretty hard to find the stuff otherwise. Uh, and Geoprobe has gotten into the game in the last three years, I'd say, with a tool called the, the uh, Optical Image Profiler, which is not laser-induced. Um, and I'll show you a slide of that in a couple minutes. So here's the UVOS tool. And basically, this is the, the business end of it that goes down into the ground. There's a sapphire window right here inside this white circle. Uh, and the laser generates really rapid pulses of light, whatever wavelength of light, whether it's ultraviolet or green or whatever. Uh, and that goes down fiber optics, shoots down here and, and comes out the sapphire window into the soil formation. And if there are aromatics there, that energy bumps the, the energy level of the aromatic molecule up. And then when the laser pulse stops, the, the uh, molecule relaxes and goes back down to its original energy state. And when it does that, it gives off fluorescent light. And that light gets picked up in the sapphire window and shot back up the fiber optics to the to the uphole uh, oscilloscope and other stuff up here where it gets processed um, and you can start to see where all the napples are. So it's, it's good for fuel napple. Um, it doesn't see dissolved contamination or at least not very well. So it's a it's a napple tool um, and it detects single and maybe double ring PAHs. Uh, you can sort of figure out what kind of fuel type you're looking at. And we'll look at that on another slide. Um, so here we go. So, so there are these four different channels, which are given, you know, colors on them. Um, and the blue is basically single ring PAHs, and they get higher and higher uh, numbers of rings as you go out through green, orange, and red. Um, and, and that can be diagnostic of what kind of petroleum product you're looking at. You can see this, this set of them up here is kerosene, this is gasoline. So you have a lot of aromatics, you have a lot of blue channel here. Um, with diesel, you're starting to get less blue channel, but you still have uh, you know, a, a lot of these other aromatics. And with oils, the blue is almost gone, and you've got a lot of uh, red, orange and, and green as well. So, you know, you can, you can figure out what's going on. Now, one thing that you do have to do um, is do a bunch of coring, maybe not a bunch, but you have to do some co-located coring so that you can compare things that are fluorescing uh, with, with an actual sample of it from the ground. There's a lot of things that will fluoresce other than fuels in the ground. Um, you know, I know Dan Bojan in the back here has done a bunch of work with, with, uh, Targost in, a, in the Pine Street Barge Canal site. 
And there's a lot of wood chips, there's a lot of peat, there's a lot of things like that that are organic molecule based that have PAHs in them. And those will fluoresce too. And under some circumstances, limestone, crushed limestone will fluoresce. So you need to get cores and put those on the window at the surface and match up the, the signal from those things as well as from the NAPL that you're working on. And here actually is uh, Dan's crew out working in the Pine Street Barge Canal with the Targost unit. So that's the, the, the uh, brains of it in the back of the pickup truck there. And then just a little geoprobe with a, you know, with a, with a probe being driven into the ground. Um, so you can get into places with a pretty small footprint. Uh, it's pretty low profile and very powerful uh, tool. This is the die lift is what it's describing earlier. So, you know, you've got the, the fiber optics, with the light coming down and out the sapphire window. Um, and this is the difference between the, the dye lift and the others is this extra tube that comes down through which the dye is injected. And if the dye happens to, to hit one of these, this is Randy's, Randy's diagram here, and he, he's drawn the napples as nice little fluffy clouds, which is kind of, you know, Randy's a sunny guy, so it's, you know, it's, that's Tim. Um, but if it gets into this, into this napple and dissolves, then you'll see it fluorescing um, after the laser light hits it. And this is one of the first uh, field trial sites that, that we did for that. And it was up in uh, Lowell, Massachusetts, not far from here. Um, and you can see all these little blobs of napples. Some of them are on the same uh, sort of elevation plane here, but some of them are scattered around. Um, and most of them are likely residual. And that's the other thing is you can kind of get a sense of, of the degree of saturation, not, not you know, numerically, but but in a relative sense, you know, the more intense the, the response, the the more the higher the saturation likely is. So some of these red zones are, are probably mobile napal, while some of these other zones are probably residual napal that are trapped by capillary forces. And this is Geoprobe's contribution to it all. So as I mentioned, this isn't laser induced. This is just uh, this is a light source down the hole. And there's actually two light sources down the hole natural light, like in the room here, and ultraviolet light. And you can do it either way. And, and the, the amazing thing to me about this device is it doesn't send things up and down on a fiber optic line to the surface. They actually put a camera down the hole. And, it, and all of you people who do direct push know what that camera must feel like when it's getting driven into the ground, right? I mean, it's getting beat up. But, it's, but they've somehow figured out how to isolate that um, so that it can continue to function. So you can either take a, you know, sort of a, a natural light photograph of the formation to get some information on the formation, or you can use ultraviolet light to get some fluorescence going on. And that's what's happening here. These are photographs taken by the camera showing fluorescence of, of you know, something out the window. You can also get the same kind of vertical uh, profile that, that you get with the other ones. What you can't get out of it, unfortunately, is the different wavelengths and the the uh, identification of the different uh, fluorescing targets. Um, the Waterloo Profiler, Waterloo APS, is, is something that um, I worked on in, in graduate school and then kept working on for many, many years and finally just uh, um, separated from it a couple of years ago. Um, but it's still a, a really good tool, um, but it can be used a lot more efficiently now when used in conjunction with other screening tools. Um, and you can get a bunch of information from a single push like physical and chemical data, specific conductance, DOORP, pH, that sort of thing. Uh, concentration data from collecting samples and analyzing them. Hydraulic head data in a vertical profile, which we don't, I think, see enough of in the, in the industry. And an index of hydraulic conductivity. So it's an injection logging tool as well. And this is what the tips look like, different sizes. Uh, there's two ways to collect a sample. One is a peristaltic pump at the surface, and the other is a uh, positive displacement gas drive pump down the hole, depending on how far down the potentiometric surface is. And so basically, we, we pressurize a container of analyte-free water with nitrogen gas, push it through a, a pressure transducer and a flow meter, down the tube and out the ports while we're driving the tool. And so you're getting this index of hydraulic conductivity in real time. This can help you figure out where to stop and collect a sample. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. So when you get to a point where we want to collect a sample, you just shut the water off, you turn the pump on, and you start pulling water back up through the sample bottles in series. So these are closed sample bottles on the suction side of the pump rather than the pressure side of the pump. So there's no exposure to the atmosphere 
there's no exposure to the pump head tubing or any of that stuff. So it's a pretty high quality sample. Um, and then you, um, when you reach equilibrium, just like in the slow purge technique, uh, you can collect a sample and just walk it over to the field lab or send it off to the, uh, the fixed lab, whichever you want to do. So here's a little one slide um, uh, case study of a little Waterloo APS uh, investigation. And this is, it says post remedy investigation. And you would hope that that doesn't have to happen a lot, but actually it does. Um, and in this case, the site had been investigated and then remedied uh, at a cost of about 4 million British pounds. And I think a British pound is worth about a buck 60 or something like that. So it's, it's fairly expensive remedy. Um, but people noticed that it didn't really seem to be working. So we came over and, and uh, took a look at it. And one of the first things I did was walk over to this river, which is actually down an embankment. But as soon as you get down close to the river, um, you know, you, your eyes start tearing up and your throat kind of constricts a little bit because the solvents coming off that river are, are just intense. Um, so clearly there's still a problem there. Um, so the second thing we did was we, we saw these existing monitoring wells uh, and we went and sampled them. We had a, a mobile laboratory with us, so we sampled them. Um, and here are the results from the monitoring wells. So here's this deep short screen. So I give them give them credit for having a short screen and having one at the bottom of the aquifer. And so we've got these two, oops, I need to fix this. So there's two trichlorobenzene compounds we're looking at. Um, and the scale is up here and it's logarithmic. So we've got, you know, one of the trichlorobenzene compounds is in the tens of PPB and the other one is in the low hundreds of PPB down at the bottom here. And in this, this pair of wells here, uh, we've got about the same thing, tens of PPB, of one isomer and and maybe a hundred of the other one and the bottom screen is clean so you know that didn't seem so bad that you know that it would cause a stream to be uh, sort of toxic to be near um, but then we did our, our little profiling thing next to these wells and i mean adjacent to them um, and these are the profiles that we got so you know you can see that that we're, we've got a number of concentrations that are higher than the than the monitoring well and of course we've got We've got them all throughout the profile. Same thing over here, you know, significantly higher, 10 ppm kind of levels. Uh, and that's right at the top of this non-detect screen here. Um, and then down here, we're in the 100 to 1,000 range where there is no screen at all. So, you know, again, you know, we're seeing differences between point sample profiling and monitoring wells. Um, but we did do the injection logging as well. And this, that's what this trace is. So this is a fairly high permeability zone. Whoops, they just spilled the, spilled the beans here. Um, and what we do when we see those low permeability zones is stop at the interface between the high and the low K zones and sample there. And when we did that on both of these holes, we, we got denapple, this little black blob in the bottom of this bottle is a denapple uh, accumulation. And we actually pumped quite a lot of it out, several liters of it out. And so, you know, what we learned in a very short period of time is that, you know, there's some significant stratigraphy there and there's still denapple present on top of those clay zones immediately adjacent to monitoring wells that told us there were, you know, maybe a few hundred PPB present. So, you know, that's a situation where investigating with monitoring wells led you down one path and, and it turned out not to be a productive path. So a lot of money was spent uh, and then a lot more money had to be spent to, to remediate again. Um, so it does make sense to, to do the high characterization work uh, actually, uh, and make sure you get it right the first time. So a similar tool is now available from Geoprobe. It's called the Hydraulic Profiling Tool Groundwater Sampler. And this is actually a picture of a, or a diagram of an older version of it. It now has um, ports all the way around the, the body of it. Um, and it works the same way. So it, it's injecting water to get this continuous uh, index of hydraulic conductivity. Um, and you can sample at whatever frequency you want. It also has an electrical conductivity dipole so you can get an electrical conductivity profile as well. And some other quick and cheap things. These guys um, are, are little piezometers that Solenst makes in Canada. And they were actually originally made by a friend of mine, Engleton, who was a technician at the University of Waterloo. And they're, they're really simple and fairly robust. It's just a stainless steel pipe with another pipe inside and a mesh screen around the outside of that. And you just put HDPE tubing on it or Teflon or whatever you want. Um, and then you, you screw on um, uh, black steel pipe. 
and you can drive these with a jackhammer, with a, just about anything. I've seen people drive them with a sledgehammer. So if you don't know anything about the hydraulic gradient or the depths to water or anything like that, you can go out to a site with a bunch of these and pound them in, make some water level measurements, figure out how the groundwater is flowing, including vertically, hopefully, um, for, for next to nothing. And then you can just pull them back out later on so nobody makes you sample them. Um, so that's that's one way to go, and that's primarily not a sampling device, but more of a hydraulic head device. Then there's the Geoprobe SP16 and SP21s. A lot of people use those because this is a standard uh, Geoprobe groundwater grab sampling tool. Any show of hands? Nobody. Amazing. Um, well, that's this, and so basically there's the the drive casing with a knockout tip in the back, or the bottom rather. And then you, you drop a, a, a screen down it. You can use a, a stainless steel wire wound screen or uh, a PVC screen, either one, uh, and just get a quick grab sample that way. And you can stack them up, get a bunch of samples. Um, you know, soil coring is the next topic of conversation here. And, and so the information that you need from soil cores are, you know, what does the geology look like? What's the hydrogeologic uh, structure look like? What are the physical, chemical, and microbial properties? So, you know, you get all the way into, you know, is, is MNA happening kind of thing. Um, contaminant mass distributions in the, in the low versus the high K zones. Phase distributions. So do you have non-aqueous phase or NAPL? Do you have dissolved contamination? Do you have sorbed contamination? Um, or do you have gas phase contamination or all of the above? Concentration gradients and diffusive fluxes, is it going into the low permeability materials or is it already coming back out of the low permeability materials? And then, you know, lastly, you can check on how your remedial uh, operation is going. If you're doing injections, or is your injection solution reaching the places that you thought it would? And is it having an oxidizing or reducing effect or whatever it was that you wanted it to do? Now here's a, this is, this is a sort of, uh, I guess it's a pet peeve of mine. And, and that is that, you know, I, I review a lot of boring logs. Um, and what I see a lot of is things like, you know, 22 feet, sand, medium, wet. And then the next sample is same as above. And the next one is same as above. And, you know, I know for a fact <laughs> that there's stuff going on in that interval. You know, there's some change in grain size. There's some change in fine content. Um, if it's clays, there's some change in, you know, is it fractured? Is it not fractured? But here's, a, here's an example of why that's important. So this is, this is a core of clay, and this was actually collected with a, a CME continuous sampler. So they've got a, a like a, a four inch, three or four inch diameter, essentially a split spoon that fits in the auger. Uh, it's five feet long, and as they auger down, this thing just gets pressed down into the soil, and then you pull up the whole split spoon. And it worked really well on this uh, aquitard material. So we've got good recovery. And then you've got this little line here, which would be pretty easy to ignore because it's just a little line. I mean, maybe it just broke along a, a cleavage plane there or something. Um, but if you bothered to open that up and look end on at it, what you would see is this is a little thin sand bed in there. And this red stuff that you're seeing is uh, PCE that's been dyed red with a Sudan 4 dye. Uh, and this was a, an experiment at Canadian Forces Base Borden where there's a sheet wall piling set up, keyed into this clay aquitard, you know, 700 gallon, uh, liters of PCE was dumped in there and, and it was, you know, a geophysical extravaganza, you know, of, of mapping this stuff out. And then it was eventually dug up and mapped out for real. Um, but this was outside the sheet pile in the aquitard. And everyone had assumed this aquitard was impervious to denapple, but it got into the aquitard, it found these little sand seams in the clay, and it, it occupied a large area outside the, 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 uh, the test cell. And so, you know, those little kinds of features are the things you've got to look for, because those are the things that, that actually are going to end up mattering a lot. Oh, before we get to the boring one? So I should stop now? Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So we'll just, we'll finish up this boring log piece. So, um, you know, a lot of you are, are working for regulatory 
agencies and you probably have to see a lot of boring logs. Um, and my guess is that you see a lot of boring logs from a lot of different companies and they all do things differently unless you require that they don't. Um, but you know, each company kind of has its own standard operating procedure for how it describes soils. Um, and there are probably at least half a dozen of them. They're all different. Um, so th that's one thing you've got to look for is what, what method are they using and what information does that, does that provide or not provide? Um, but then once you get past that, the idea is, you know, are they being consistent? are the descriptions consistent and do they include all the elements that that particular method requires them to, to, uh, to include. Um, and, you know, the things I like to see are, you know, the, the grain size distribution. I mean, I know it's a, it's an estimate, but you know, how much of it is sand, how much of it is silt, how much of it is clay, uh, how much of it is gravel and to see that consistently throughout. Um, you know, one thing that people don't realize a lot, I think, is that if you have a, a you know, a medium to fine sand uh, that's 10 to 15 percent fines, that has a very low hydraulic conductivity. That's not a that's not a hydraulic conductivity that you, you would associate with a sand. It's more like a silt. Um, so when you see those, you know, 10 to 15 percent or higher uh, percentages of fines, you know, you want to key on that as sort of an aquitard type of material. Um, but then the other things, you know, ideally you will have, you know, the interval that the sampler was driven. You'll have, if it's a split spoon kind of approach, you'll have the blow counts. So you can have some information on how difficult it is to drive, uh, which is good if you're gonna follow up maybe with a direct push kind of approach. Um, a lot of them have PID screening columns on them. So you can record the, the results of the PID and that can be pretty useful. Um, and then like in this case, uh, you know, there's a record of, you know what samples were collected and where. Um, so I guess that's that's it for today. Oh, percent recovery is huge. Yeah, there's a whole another section of this talk that goes nuts on on uh, recovery. Yeah, so that's a huge thing actually. Is that you know um, a lot of a lot of methods in a lot of terrains uh, won't necessarily do that well. So you end up with recoveries that are 50 percent or less. Um, and, and what that means basically is that you're not seeing a good chunk of the stratigraphic profile, which might be controlling, you know, a lot of what's going on and, and how the plume's going to behave and how your remedy is going to behave. So if you're seeing a lot of low recoveries, um, you might want to suggest that they spend a little time thinking about how they're doing that sampling and what can they do to, to, to change things so that they're getting better recoveries. Um, and you can come on down to Connecticut next week and I'll try to show you all that. So I tomorrow. tomorrow. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah, sorry about that. We got a little behind, but now we're even more behind. So um, thank you so much. Does anybody have any burning question for Seth before we break? So three quick things that I forgot to say before in my stress about the webinar, um, which is that if people are here for the LSP, the LEP, or the New Jersey LSRP credits, uh, there will be sign-in sheets that you have to initial uh, after each break and after the lunch. So they'll be out um, front before we start again. Um, I also forgot to say that the presentations are all posted online. So um, if you didn't already get my email about that, you can get the presentations yourself. And we're trying to record the webinar so that hopefully um, the uh, recording, the audio will go with it. <clears throat> um, however, Seth didn't quite get finished with all the slides. But uh, so um, I feel like there was, was that three things? Oh. And I have to apologize to the people in the back. We're room. I guess the uh, air conditioning isn't working in the other room, so they didn't want us to boil to death. So they stuck us in here with a smaller screen. So I, I want to apologize, but the presentations are up online. With that, we'll break uh, just for 10 minutes. So get back here at 11.35. Ah, wow.
Ah, 